This week, three sides of the coin. We go into the audio rabbit hole this week. We are joined by Frank Ken Stein, and he talks all about his brand new Hotter Than Hell remix. Not a remaster, a remix. It's like a new version of Hotter Than Hell that still holds tribute to the original recording, but it sounds like what you've kind of always wanted it to sound like. That's and not an it, exaggeration. It's not an exaggeration. And Ken lets us know what are the next projects he's working on. And some of these sound pretty freaking exciting. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Visit threesidesofthecoin.com. Subscribe on YouTube. Follow and rate us on Spotify. Subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. We appreciate your support. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. We're back to the show you love to hate. (laughs) I, I didn't say that. I didn't plan that. I didn't even think to set that up. But damn, Mark, you got, I got to hand it to you. I hinted to this in our last episode. You two guys are learning. You really are. <laughs> I feel like I'm the Jedi master and and you you're learning. Now it's just to keep you from going to the dark side. No, way, you, you're sensei. This, I wore this shirt for Alex. Alex, this is for you. Um striper so much. All right. So I, I do we just get right into who our guest is and what we're talking about, or is there anything else? Do we need to put a quarter in you for anything, Mark? Are you good? Well, you know, you know what? We can we can hold off. I I, I had, but we we our guest was so great. I we we went over time. I can get the quarter some other time. This guest you brought to the table, and I'm not saying that to dissociate myself, but you're proud. You found a great guest. Who who joins us, and what are we going to talk about here? Well, you know, over the last week after all that craziness, um, I saw, because again, you guys, you guys, guys, I wouldn't know anything that is on any other site, anywhere on the web, if you guys didn't send it to me in an IM or something. I, I don't, I, I'm just not a computer guy about all that sort of stuff. But I got a couple of people like, hey, have you heard this rock and roll over remix and i'm like you can't remix no 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 not rock and roll over excuse me uh hotter than hotter than hell you you can't you can't uh, because i know that because i'm a musician i'm like you can't and and i just said something to my buddy goes oh no he he like sample blah 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 he was just kind of in the most basic terms told me how he did it i'm like well where is it he sends me the link it was on youtube and i and i was ready like after 30 seconds to just do what I do almost a hundred percent of the time when I get stuff like that. I listen the first 30 seconds. I go, okay, next. This one, this hotter than hell remix. I got through like 30 seconds in. I'm like, well, this is fucking awesome. And then I got to parts on the record. Like that's not how it is on the record. I fell in love with this thing. So I was listening to it on YouTube and then I, reached out to um to ken and i just said hey i really love your work um would you mind sending me the audio files i said because you know i'm not very computer savvy and i wanted to put them so i could listen to it in my truck on the way home from work because uh you know anyways so he sends them to me like two seconds later and i'm like well you know that was awfully nice you i didn't you know no back and forth sparring or and I fuck, I just fell in love with 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 what 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 he did. And so after a couple of days of listening to it, I'm like, and then I started talking to Tommy, and Tommy's like, wow, I'm blown away by it too. I'm like, I'm gonna see if he wants to come on the show. So I talked to these two idiots and they were like, uh, yeah, you can ask him on the show. And you know, next thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. And uh we're uh we we you, we've got well over an hour, what, maybe an hour and a half? I mm-hmm. didn't even really pay attention. Coming up here where we sit down with Ken and he tells us 
his history as a Kiss fan. By the way, why he's Frank Ken Stein, Stein on Frank YouTube. And Big Ken, Ken Stein. He, he he's done all kinds of video stuff too, which <coughs> is really good. But I gotta admit, I'm that's not the that's not the stuff that blows me away. This is what blows me away. I am blown away by his passion, his incredible talents, and hearing something that was old and is now new. Yep. And uh, yeah. I'm telling you, I, I'm blown he, away. He, he, he tells us how he did it. <clears throat> he, he drops, not drops hints, he comes right out and tells us what remixes he's working on next, what he wants to do. This is if, if you're an a Kiss fan, audio geek nerd, this is the episode for you. You want to you want to pay attention and uh, start thinking about what you want to request him to work on because he's taking requests. So let it roll. Frank Ken Stein and his hotter than hell. Re- Are you looking for official three sides of the coin merchandise? T-shirts, hoodies, and more. Visit shop three sides of the coin.com. We ship worldwide. Hey, three sides fans, what's going on? Uh, one of the things that's going on currently in the uh, Kiss Nerd Zone, and I mean that in the loving way, is there's this freaking awesome remix done of Hotter Than Hell, and everybody's going crazy over it and uh, i talked to tommy and i'm like I, we're like oh my god this thing's great and blah 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 and i'm like so i decided to uh to uh get a hold of a guy named ken nardi better known to you who, uh out in kiss land is frank ken stein <laughs> and uh, we want to welcome frank ken stein nardi to our show thank, so, thanks the- ken thank you guys Wow, what a fucking job you did. I, I'm just telling you, you, as as not only as a KISS fan, but as a musician, one of my super nerdy rock and roll friends. Matter of fact, Joe was a, a guest on our show. We talked Cheap Trick. We've been gushing over your remix of, of the Hotter Than Hell album now for Amazing. about a week. Thank you. And then I, 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 let's just start here. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of work in reverse. Dude, this is a labor of love. This must have taken forever, I'm assuming. Did it? And can you tell us all about your incredible Hotter Than Hell remix? Well, it didn't take forever because it's finished. So technically, we should <laughs> be doing it. No, um, well, one of the things is, you know, when I started messing around with some of this stuff a couple years back, um, the way I view when I'm playing around with, now, I should say I'm a Kiss fan from 1977. I was about nine, 10 years old when I got into them. I, I actually saw the Paul Lynn thing. Uh, I was like, but I had no idea what Kiss was. I did not become a fan that day. I know it's, it's you know, every Kiss fan wants to be the earliest, youngest. That was two when I heard Hotter Than Hell, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> but but about a year or so later, my older brother, three years older, he brought home Kiss Alive. Now, this is already probably 77. So I'd say I'm a second wave Kiss fan. I'm not one of those guys that was lucky enough to see him in the clubs in the early 70s, pre-alive. That's a whole other group of people, but I was definitely on board probably around uh, Alive 2 was out already. But, I, you know, when I saw the solo albums come out, Dynasty, on and on. Uh, and I often think I was the almost the exact now, not for the first wave, because and I never got this when I was younger, but the older I got, I understand that huge shift that did happen with Destroyer. And I can see that those early fans really and I mean, gr- growing up with Kiss in the 70s, it was all great. It was all Kiss. But I can understand, especially after some of that really early stuff and the Super 8 stuff, you see it's it really is a whole different game you know you know you see like teenagers early 20s 30s you know that's the crowd um but i was the exact age that they probably were appealing to ultimately you know i was about 10 years old uh, in 78 and then i was 11 12 dynasty i loved it then again you know i like disco anyway i like rock and roll and i like disco and not that it's a disco record we won't get into that but i mean i didn't have an issue um I loved Unmasked. Uh, I was like the guy who was like the last man standing in my school, my neighborhood. I was like the Kiss fan that never gave up, right? Um, And I am a charter, elder, absolute lover, okay? I was about 12 when it came out. Boy, look at the time. How how, how, how about about, about Crazy Nights, Ken? How about Crazy Nights? Well, let's not get carried away. (laughs) I'll tell you, I'll tell you, though. No, I'll tell you, though. Um, 
so when the elder came out, I was about 12. Okay. And I was in a band with two guys. We were like literally in eighth grade. We knew like two songs and, and my dad played guitar and, and, and sang growing up Johnny Cash and Elvis and all that. I grew up with mm. music in the house. Nice. Um, you, you might not be able to tell when you hear me, but um, so anyway, I was uh, in a band with two guys who discovered Rush right when the elder came out. So we were of that age right now. I was team kiss forever, but I was like, I liked the little deeper, wider kiss. I loved it. Um, I love it to this day. It was it had a huge impact on my musical writing, on my musical. Um, it's, and I'm not just saying that to be a contrarian or anything like that. I absolutely loved it. Um, now, the Japanese version, uh, the record company were right, okay? The Oath is one of the most kick-ass openers ever. Forget the story. It's the same story we've heard a million different times and places. The Elder, or the Oath kicking off, and I, it, it, to me, it's a perfect sequence, the U.S. version. Okay. Having said all that, I understand why people do or don't like it. Uh, it's not perfectly executed. I'll get to that because I'm, I'm working on a really fun version of that album, which is going to be one of my next big things. Anyway, but I was of that age. And then I got into Judas Priest, Iron Maiden in my early teens, the Creatures of the Night. Boom. Right up my alley, right? I was right into it. Uh, Lick It Up, I even love. Now, I kind of, now I ended up playing more of a progressive thrash type stuff eventually. So I wasn't a hair metal guy. You can argue about where the kiss was hair metal, whatever. Um, I did see them up to Animal Eyes. I saw that tour. I saw the Creatures tour. Was too young, unfortunately, to see Dynasty. Every other freaking kid in my class went, though. And I saw their cheap shirts and from they bought in the car to the parking garage with the glitter that fell off after one washing <laughs> but, but i mean i was absolutely but uh, but uh, i saw animal eyes and i'll be honest i sat at that concert about four or five songs in and i just thought you know this is just isn't my kiss anymore it just isn't um and that's not to disrespect them i understand there's just as much great music that came out of the 80s even even uh, crazy nights all of it's got something good about it and i still stayed i still uh, kept an eye on them you know the 90s is when i was getting all the bootleg stuff and it was falling in love with all the old stuff all over again uh, I was divorced for the first time living with a, a buddy of mine and I would order, I actually got all of mine through the Domino video order forms, you know, back then. And I'd get these tapes uh, every week or two. You'd send like, I think 20 bucks and you got two hours worth of whatever. You could pick and choose. They'd dub a sixth generation copy. And I'd pop these things in and my roommate who was really wasn't a Kiss fan growing up, you know, either you were or you weren't, he wasn't. And he'd watch these with me and he'd go, how can you even watch this? I'm like, are you crazy? This is solid gold stuff, man. I mean, because it's, it's, KISS is very strange in that, you know, there's all this rewritten history. Uh, KISS were absolutely everywhere in those late 70s. I don't care what anybody says. You may not have been a fan. They were everywhere, but they weren't everywhere. You didn't see them on TV hardly ever. You didn't hear them on the radio hardly ever. They were everywhere if you were a KISS fan, absolutely. Okay, they were in all the magazines, they were in everything. But... You never got to see, I mean, we got cable like the year after the Tokyo. I would have lost my mind if I'd have seen that Tokyo concert on HBO. We got it the year later, okay? I had no idea they ever even aired that on TV. I would have, I can't imagine what seeing that concert in 79, I would have just blown my mind. So anyway, um, but you know, I was in that second wave. I watched, uh, I watched uh, Meets the Phantom uh, when it aired you know, to, to October 28th, I was there watching it as a 10 year old. Uh, I was super embarrassed the next day as a 10 year old at school when all the older kids <laughs> gave me shit about how awful it was. And I think as a 10 year old, I kind of knew something's a bit of man seeing kiss was awesome, but I saw him on Fridays. I saw almost all that stuff when it was first time around and people say what they want. Uh, kiss were everywhere. 77, 78, 79, whether you liked it or not, they were huge. Okay. Now the numbers might've been cooked and all that, but that's, that's every band, right? So anyway, so I've been on board forever and ever. Then I got into music of my own. I uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, for about seven years, I was in a band called Anna Crucis. I was lead singer, guitar player. Um, I always did all of our production myself. I, I, I wrote the lion's share and, and what I didn't write riffs. I, I arranged all of our music and everything like that. So I've always been into ever since I was 12 and I, my brother got the wall and I heard it with headphones and it blew my mind. This idea of sounds and putting it together is still my all time. Nothing's ever topped that album for me. Uh, is, that is an incredible album. It's, it's and, the, and, yeah. and I think all four of us, it's incredible to be able to say we got the wall before the wall became the wall, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. When it was just a new album from Pink yeah. Floyd that right. yeah. there was no expectations. And that well, album it, it, just... Yeah was phenomenal it's it so, not was it is just a phenomenal 
album song. So I, I guess the dichotomy with me with Ez, Bob Ezrin is that uh, now I was never really a big Alice Cooper Cooper fan. I just I tended to get into stuff my older brother got into. That's just and once I was into Kiss, I was like almost like only Kiss, right? Liked a little Aria, a little Boston, whatever, all that stuff. Um, but I was just a Kiss guy and. Um, as much as I love The Wall, my number one all-time favorite uh, album, and, and next to George Martin, Ezra is probably my most respected uh, producer hero, um, and of course The Elder. Um, having said that, I think he ruined Kiss. I really do. I have a very strong opinion. And what I mean by that is, I mean he ruined Peter Chris. I really honestly believe he ruined Peter Chris. If you listen to what Peter contributed on those early albums and on those concerts, I think he was MVP much of the time. Paul was still kind of coming into his own. You know, and when you look back on this stuff now, much older and you see, and if you played music, you can see Paul isn't like, you see Paul 75 to Paul 77. There's a huge shift, okay? He became the rock star sex symbol the epitome of the rock the leader of the band um and that's when i came on board but if but if you look back a little earlier and especially you go back and listen to the uh, the daisy concert peter came from an era where the drummer was the band leader okay and you can tell he's doing a lot of talking it wasn't that weird so you can see where a lot of this uh as as, as baby paul got pushed to the front peter got pushed farther and farther back and farther and farther up on that drum riser in the background i can see where some of that came from but but um it's very interesting, though, when you look at uh, the, 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 the personalities in a band like Kiss. Um, and unfortunately, we'll probably never get the movie that should be made. You could make a fantastic movie about those guys, about their personalities, about their story. It'll never happen. But anyway, um, I remember the first time uh, I went out to L.A. in 1990 for Foundations Forum, which is like a uh, industry yep. music thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we stayed. Uh, we were our a band at that time was on Metal Blade Records out of L.A., that's where Slayer got started and some of the yeah. other you know, bands. Um, we were on Metal Blade. We stayed with the record rep at his house. This is the first time I ever saw any bootleg. This was 1990. He pops in Young Music Show, uh, and he's got... Uh, and, and who, who would that be? Was that William Howell? No, no, no. This was a uh, guy's name was uh, Nails, and he was just a, a rep. He wasn't like okay. Slagle, or, Slagle or anybody like that. You know, he wasn't like the... the he was just a rep uh, who signed us. So we stayed at his house for those few days. He pops in Tom Snyder. Now, the thing that sucks about me, I've got the worst timing. I was the only guy that cared about Kiss anymore. I missed when they took the makeup off on MTV. Even though I watched MTV every day, I had no idea. I heard at school, did you see Kiss take their makeup off last night? No. I had no idea the Tom Snyder interviewed aired when it aired in 79. Okay, I didn't see it. That was Halloween night. I don't know, but... I don't it, was, it, it actually was, what, 45 years ago today. Okay, yeah. whatever the case was, I didn't know about it until the bootlegs. And when you pop that thing in, it's almost like, you know, I feel like it's like I go in, okay, I'm in Walmart, I walk into the restroom, I open, I kick open the stall door and Kiss is sitting on the toilet. And it's like, I'm looking at them in this interview, like this is almost pornographic and that their personalities are so on display here. And it's so raw and uncomfortable and weird that as a Kiss fan, because I don't even know if I knew what their talking voices other than the movie, I didn't know what Kiss talked like. I didn't know anybody's personalities. I didn't know any of the dynamic. And you watch that, man, you could do a whole, um, probably like a PhD in psychology on that interview, I think. And and the inner band dynamics, okay? Because it's a very, very interesting insight. But anyway, so I've always been into Kiss stuff. I was buying those crappy bootlegs back in the day. And then of course, you know, we, we, we go on through the 90s and then we get to the internet comes around. You got people like Mickey G. You got people putting stuff on DVD. It's awesome. It's all great. And then, you know, I kind of semi-retired from music many, many, many years ago. We did some reunion stuff in like 2010, 2013. I did a couple solo albums in recent years under my own name. But I kind of retired from music. I don't really do anything. So, but I've got all of these skills that I've learned. You know, I started with eight track, um, or actually two track reel to reel. My dad had one. Then the four track multi-track recorders in the 80s and then on up and then studio. I'm all self-taught though. So I'm really old. I'm kind of like at this age where... I'm kind of old school and new school mixed together. Same with video stuff. Um, my band did a video. We actually had a, a song called Sound the Alarm that got shown on MTV's Headbangers Ball like in one time or something in, in 93. Um, we did a student video. We paid like, I think $2,000. We had a buddy that was a huge fan in town, was going to university for film and video editing. He was a huge fan. And for his project, he'd do stuff with my band. So we actually did a video on film, the whole deal. It was crazy. I won't get into all that. but. 
I would go up at night with him to the studio at this college uh, of the university up there over overnight. We'd go up there during the night and get in there and do the editing. And it was all AB roll, A, A, B, A, B roll stuff, you know, three quarter tape. And then it was just digital videos just coming in, but it was no digital, no computer stuff really yet. So I saw like how the old stuff work, you know, you, people don't realize when they film those old 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter, like you don't just look through the eyepiece like a camcorder, like you got to measure the light, you got to like, the film is expensive. You plan the shot, boom, you roll it for 10 seconds and you stop. That's why when people get the Super 8 and they're like, why do they only film, you know, 10 seconds and 10 seconds? Like, because you had like three or four minutes probably. That's all you had and you're real, right? So anyway, and then I've got into stuff later on on my own through to, to the, uh, to the to, you know, computers. I've been a programmer for 20 something years. Now I got into programming stuff. So I know a little about computer stuff too. So anyway, recent years, um, the way I look at the stuff I do, it's kind of like I was always been fascinated by the old the old Foley soundstage guys. You know how they used to do? They'd film stuff, and then you do your replacement. You know, you, okay, there's a guy walking across the parking lot. Now I got to get some hard shoes, and I'm going to walk across the parking lot. And uh, so what you're hearing isn't his feet or his shoes, but it's representing pretty perfectly what you would hear had they recorded it that way. When I would do like um, a couple of these concert videos of Kiss. Um, I'm not really like so worried about fixing mistakes, whatnot. I, as a Kiss fan, you know, Kiss always said, you know, they wanted to make the band they always wanted to hear. Well, I want to make some of the video and audio that I always wanted to hear as a fan. And so, you know, a show like Largo, which, you know, there's no real controversy about ownership or any of that junk. It's a show that can go on YouTube. Nobody's going to complain. So I did my best to clean it up. And then I thought, you know, how great would it have been to have a live two as a concert, you know, and we have the lost alive Two, you know, the Tokyo thing where some of that obviously came from but to me i'm like i want to try to make this sound like a live two ish but keep all the nuance of that performance um it's not i always say my stuff is absolutely not for the purist okay it's not and i get it if you don't want to see stuff change that's fine uh i'm not kiss i don't work for kiss i'm not replacing or getting rid of the old version it's always there you can always go watch your vhs or your digital uh exact you know horribly sounding version if you want to and I've, we've all seen them a million times what I'm doing is something different, something that, you know, maybe you want to see it. And I know uh, my band had some notoriously bad production on our first couple albums in particular. And I learned the hard way back when uh, I transferred some of our stuff to digital 20 years ago and remixed one of our albums that I particularly didn't like the sound of. And I thought it was great and everyone hated it. Because guess what? Everyone, I don't care how bad it is, don't change it. Okay, that's that's how some people just are. So the stuff I'm doing, even with Hotter Than Hell, I get it because I know uh, all of the symbols are not exactly what he's playing in that studio because I pulled symbols from Alive and, and picked, you know, uh, as, you know, as a drummer, thinking like a drummer, I'll, I will sequence drums. I use something like a superior drummer, uses patterns, you piece them together, you change and whatever. So, you know, Peter plays a lot of the same stuff and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the songs. So it's pretty easy. I'm like, oh, he's doing the, you know, dun, 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 dun. okay, that's, you know, rock and roll all night. He does it. He does it. I've uh, got to choose. He does it several places. I'll go, I'll lift it. I'll sync it. I'll pull those toms and then I'll recreate a better sound quality of what it is. Now, I don't think I'm changing what he's doing. It's Peter Chris. It's his playing. It's synced up. He hits a snare. You hear a Peter Chris snare. To me, it's not really, it's, it's not cheating. You know, I'm not playing along and sequencing my own drums to replace him. Uh, I'm not replacing them because they're off key. I mean, Kiss sang on key pretty well all the time. I mean, this stuff's not bad. Uh, we can, a real quick side thing, you know, let's talk about Kiss Alive real quick and Kiss Alive 2. The thing I love about Kiss Alive 2 is that it is a creation. And most of us didn't know that growing up, listening to that stuff. Um, dude, it was a concert as far as I do. You know, Kiss Alive 2 was a concert, a Kiss concert. Um, and only when I found out what it really was, I became more intrigued. I was like, how did, wow, they, this is cool. how did they do that? How These did they create songs, something these like These three that? songs came from Japan. This is probably Soundcheck. This one is LA probably mm -hmm. with a redone vocal. And I can tell you, you isolate the vocals. Um, they're all redone. They're all, I mean, 100% redone. There's no bleed. There's no background sound. You can hear when you talk. You can hear what's going on if you've played with music long enough. Um, and, and, and I think Alive... Dude, we've all heard the bootlegs. It sounds exactly like his sound in 1975. I don't care if they recorded every note of it again. It sounded identical to what that they Tulsa show is a great example. That Dude, Tulsa seven. Any of it. Yeah, and together. the Cleveland stuff and the wild. Yeah, any, any of those. It's not a matter. When you're recording, okay, let's say we do a live show. Let's say you're not even Kiss. And back then, 
most guys looked at their shoe before shoe gaze was a thing. Most of the dudes had beards and my buddy calls it mustache rock, you know, seventies bands looking down, just jamming. Imagine what kiss is doing, running around, jumping around. Of course, it's going to be little flubs and mistakes. So even that aside, okay, let's say you record the show. Ace hit a wrong note or Paul's out of tune, whatever. A lot of that stuff happened a lot of the time. And, and like they even said, they didn't even have tuners back in the early days. They're just tuning by ear, right? So there's stuff where it's just really badly out of tune. Well, let's say you hit a bum chord. Well, you're recorded on a stage with a Marshall amp. You got a microphone in front of it. It's placed a certain way. What's going to be easier? Setting up that amp and trying to punch in and out that one little two or three chords. Or just saying, Ace, this is a two-minute song, dude. Just run through it. Okay, run through it. It'll sound per, it'll sound the same. We don't have to match the mic, match the sound. And that's really a lot of why a lot of that stuff's done. And it doesn't matter whether it's accurate or not. Now, the thing that kills me about the, and there are always, you know, I always joke like, uh, and I think Abraham Lincoln once said, you know, you can please most of the people some of the time and some of the people most of the time, but you can't please any KISS fans any of the time. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln said that <laughs> so on YouTube. Yeah, There's so. so much truth to that. But, but as much as you want everyone to like it, right? But you have to understand, I, I get it, and I know how people are. I'm a Star Wars fan, too. I had Kiss and Star Wars. Probably grew up in the greatest era of all time, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I'm one of these guys. I'm, I am just like George Lucas, but I also freaking hated it when he changed Star Wars. I was one of those people. Because he didn't give us the original. Like, that's the difference. If we would have had the original and the cleaned up one, fine. But I wanted to see the original one, you know? And as far as I'm concerned, you know, you look at something like Largo, NPR Winterland, and people are like, oh, you know, I changed it. It's all cleaned up. This ain't the real raw thing. I look at it, look at it the other way around. We've had Kiss Alive too, right? Or let's say we've had Kiss Alive. What, how alive it is or not doesn't really matter. Then you actually, if they were to put out, like, we're all dreaming of this box set, you know, give us those unedited edited for or whatever shows they did. Detroit, Wildwood, you know, give us those shows raw. How cool is it to hear the raw version of what you've already been listening to, right? To me, it's the other way around. You can still go watch Largo. There's 20 versions of it up online. It's raw. It sounds, you could do what you can do. There's only so much. It looks, some look good, some look whatever. And then this is something that's different. Now, I've done it kind of in reverse, you know? And with Hotter Than Hell, um, I mean, we all, love, it's a great, I mean, I, I really, after having remixed and done all that stuff, when you hear those songs, really clearer whether it's 100 percent authentic or not beside the point dude it's a super great album i mean i would well, almost say it's the best in the world yeah, yeah i've always that's... felt that way that i love the record but i can't stand listening to it so yeah. you gave me a big gift now i want to hear it cool that's cool well, it sounds I, I that different what, also too the one thing that really drew me to this was the fact i love and i and I, I remember in the text i said you i said to you i love that you had the courage to change some of the arrangements. It made it fresh for me. I'll give you a great example. Um, specifically, you took the end of Parasite and you made it like it was on the live record. Yeah. And, a lot of times you don't even realize it. You don't even realize. I, you know, it was the longest time till I realized there's no third chorus. Yes, on, on, yes exactly. I don't know if you knew that all along. I never really thought about it. And then later, well, I, I did. Later. I'll tell you why. Because because playing, uh, you know, much like we talk, playing in uh, a, a band that covers that song. Yeah. With like a, a guitar player, you tell them to make sure you learn the live version. Right. Because the ending is different. Well, it, but and, also on the album, they also stop for the opening riff again. Da, 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 correct. Da, with, correct. Oh, yeah. They don't do that yeah. live. Yeah, Don't it's all that weird stuff. Correct. In fact, a, a little a little side thing about about Peter and about drumming. It's very interesting. I was playing around with um, you know, there's the the raw footage. You know, it's we're not going to get into all that. The, the, you know, the "Come On and Love Me" video stuff um, that was that was leaked out and stuff. It's got all those takes of "Come On and Love Me." And I was playing around with syncing it up just to watch it for myself, see what it looks like. And I kept going, "What in the hell is Peter playing? Why isn't this working?" Right? Because I pride myself on being pretty good with the syncing stuff. Um, I realized Peter doesn't play it in that video like the album. And if you listen to Come On Love Me on that album, and, and after we do this talk, Mark especially, listen to what he plays on the album. Listen to what he plays live. It, you probably know. Dude, there's almost no fills on the album version. Even the is totally timed differently, the come on. And this is my theory. They threw the song together. Peter played it pretty straight. Never heard vocals. Maybe there weren't vocals yet. And Peter is like Keith Moon in that he played to the vocal a lot of the time. A lot of those fills play to the vocal melodies and i think after paul Ken, what you just it, said 
Ken, what you just said is exactly what a lot of people, if you don't play the drums, you will not notice. Right. Peter especially is, and, and guys, this is part of his feel. This is not, this is not a criticism. It's who he is. And like you doesn't said, matter, Mark. I'm going to take shit for it right now. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Peter sometimes from fucking verse to the next verse, he'd play the bass drum pattern different. I know. Tell, tell me, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm sampling the stuff. I'm breaking it. Tell me about it. I don't want to be freaking him. And he is and, and one again, of the drummers. When, when you're talking to me crazy. people who don't play drums, they, they just don't understand that. Right. And right. there's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't ruin it. It doesn't let, suck. Because, but it's it's weird. And it, okay, let, and like you said, uh, a lot of that, I'll give you a great example. Um, I'm a big Mop the Hoople fan, too. And they were talking to Buffin, the original drummer. And, and I forget which song it is. He goes, I broke my stick during the take. But the producer said, we have no money. You get one take each time. <laughs> so he kept, fuck, you can hear almost like a little screw up. Yeah. It was no different with Kiss to the degree that they didn't have a lot of money. Like you said, he may have, and I don't know this, but you hit on a great point. He may have done these, oh, this is this is the chorus. This is the verse. This right. is the chorus. Yep. Okay, here we're going to go out. And that was the drum tape. Right. That was the yeah, because and, and he guys, goes, keep you in know, mind, in 1975, they didn't have any fucking money. Right. And, and, and I think, were, and I think, and I think, through this shit. and I think they threw the song together. I think Peter tracked it. Okay, here's the break. Here's the verse. Here's the chorus. And he went, dun, 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 come on. You know, it goes, come on, the hi hat yeah. on this. But, live come on and love he does it yes because he's doing it to paul's vocal he heard the vocal they started rehearsing it peter's listening to paul's vocal and he's changed it and it's subtle but if you really look at it you're like oh that's weird so let me let me say some of drummers real quick per the conversation you know we won't get but it's really interesting to me because my band had four albums we had three drummers over four albums very similar to kiss okay and this is how and i'm not going to talk about personalities there we we had three super great guys uh not personality wise, but drumming wise. Our first drummer, Mike, right out of high school, we were young guys, we we're like 17, 18, 19. He was just hit everything as hard as you can. Not he just 50 times too many symbols, everything, you know, everything 16, every, you know, crazy. A um, little sloppy, very rough around the edges, uh, even on the albums. Yeah, but it was Mike. And then our second, our, our, our second drummer came in. Now he was my old friend, Chad Smith, not the Chili Pepper Chad Smith, a guy named Chad Smith who, I went to high school with, he was in my band before Anacrusis. And Chad is one of these guys. Now, Chad played the Geezer Butler. He was on the second GZR album, I think Omeworks or whatever it's called. Um, uh, Geezer's mm -hmm. got a St. Louis connection, that's why. But anyway, but Chad, Chad's one of these guys, probably read every book, knows all the technique, plays like a machine. Every note's the right volume in the studio, everything. But he makes it look too easy. He makes it, he's one of those guys. And to me, the Kiss comparison always fit best with singer was the Matt Sorum. Okay, Matt Sorum is obviously a fantastic professional drummer, but you listen to what Adler did compared to the way Sorum plays stuff. That's that's the thing. So our second drummer, technically probably much better than Mike, but very by the book. So he was closer to singer than our, than he did one album that we had a third drummer. He was a mix of both, okay? He was rock solid tempo, a little bit less sloppy than our first drummer. Um, but a little looser than Chad, right? A little looser. Got a good, good mix of the two. Now, I think Kiss is out of order, okay? Or my band was out of order with what they did. And our guitar player used to say, this sounds like a Paul quote, but our guitar player used to say, our first drummer, Mike, or I'm sorry, our second drummer, Chad, made love to his drums. Mike fucked them, okay? And so <laughs> that's the quote. And it, so I'll, I'll put the Kiss drummers like this. This is the analogy. I was thinking about this earlier because you guys, I was listening to what you guys were talking about. So to me, if you want to get banged and then the guy just shuts up and leaves, that's Peter. If you want a bubble bath and candles, that's probably Eric Singer. If you want to get banged and have a really nice guy to talk to afterwards and snuggle with, that was Eric Carr. Okay. <laughs> I think I, I think, didn't say this, people. I didn't make any of those comments. I think <laughs> that it's not a matter of who's better and who's because technically it doesn't dude is bruce Kulick a technical better player than ace absolutely no is, is vinny well we won't get into vinny i'm a i, I liked vinny and kiss i'm not a big particularly oh, i love vinny kiss too look at yeah. the time it's, it's, look at the time but, well, look, anyway. I, don't, I, I have to say this i don't have a problem with any of the heat that we're taking from that episode my only issue 
is that there was a group of people who were overreacting and no, it was reacting. just the title. It was the title. You guys didn't the was, title, which we, we, we scanned through the whole with. show. I'm like, where's the drum stuff? Where's the drum stuff at? Right. <laughs> which is which is fair. I know. I get it. I get it. How can you rem- how can you make a remark on something when you've never listened to what was said? Right. Right. But That's anyway, my point story. about who's better and who's not. Um, my final comment after my my sex analogy is: bottom line is those old Kiss songs. Those are fucking songs. Those aren't making love songs. That's why Peter played them like nobody else did, including Eric Carr. And I loved Eric. Uh, I think Eric gets a really raw deal because if you look at the elder, if you look at the oath, I'm guessing that's Eric. Uh, Eric's idea is great drum stuff in that. Very unorthodox for Kiss. I call the oath uh, proto power metal. I mean, for 81, it's it's swords and heroes and it's freaking double bass and it's power chords. It's power metal. You know, I mean, we had Dio and some stuff, but I mean, that song really hugely influenced me going forward. And I'm guessing that's Eric, right? Eric was really letting go. And if you watch the Australia show um, where Peter would just, you know, it's like doing that dynasty show. I got a whole theory about Peter anyway, but you know, Peter will just hit that freaking time all the way through New York groove. What's Eric do though? Eric's throwing a lot of cool, tasty stuff. Yeah. In there, right. Yeah. Now Eric is a pretty stock. He, I'm not going to say, you know, he, but Peter was no John Bonham and no one was John Bonham, right? I mean, but, but Peter was his own thing. Eric Carr was his own thing. Eric Carr, I think, was a very, definitely an adequate, more than adequate drummer, a great guy. Fans loved him. I loved him when he came in. I was on board when Peter left and Eric came in. I loved Eric, always did. Um, I know he probably came in and then, hey, here's the elder. And he's like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> you know, poor guy. You know, he's like, well, for him, that had to have sucked. <laughs> Seriously, that had to have sucked coming in yeah he's like i'm joining kiss man that's what i mean you expect to be playing you know because that was his roots he loved john bonham he liked yeah and then you come in and like the first record you're doing you're like oh my god what the fuck is right i am just a boy i mean yeah what kills me what the fuck kills me by creatures is Dude, and, and, and this is a new thing. The last few years, everyone shits on the drum sound. Dude, it's digital, but man, in 80, uh, 81 or 82 when Creatures came out, nobody hated that drum sound, dude. It was it was cannons. It was ruled. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. You know, it wasn't the real room like Bonham and stuff, but dude, it was. he's the MVP of Creatures because the drum, I mean, his drum sound is the MVP. It's not even his well, thing. He plays yeah, great, but you but know he's what? not doing anything song, fantastic. That, that's such a strong album song. Oh, yeah, 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 for and, sure. And they really hadn't rocked that hard since Side 4 of Alive 2. I mean, that right. was one of the things that took, right, and, and also, too, because I'm a few years older than you, not not much, but I'm a few years older. I, you know, in, in 1980, you know, I was 15. Right. And I was just and, and already playing in bands. Matter of fact, I played I played my first bar at 15 years old because that's just how life was back then. And the fact that I was getting into Ozzy and, and women and children first, you right. know, Van Halen and, and and it it was a different world. I wanted Kiss, who whose albums prior to Dynasty could could do any of those. You know, they rocked right. hard. And I was like, will you get on with it? Fuck, start rocking, man. Right. And then when when Creatures came out, I was like, here we go. We're, well, we're well, and, who, and who opened for Kiss in 79 and 80? Priest, you, Maiden. Priest. Maiden yeah. too, right? Uh, and that, Yes, in 19, yeah, 1980. 80. Yes, I mean, Europe. you can't tell me that didn't have a huge influence. And here's something. Well, also the other way around. You know, Living After Midnight yeah. was... You know, Rob oh, yeah. said we wrote that because of Kiss. We needed like an rock anthem, all, so rock and roll night race. or something. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, big, yes. big priest band. So they yeah. each had influence on one another. And I always said, just and then we'll, we'll you know, get back to hotter than hell. Yeah. I always thought on Turbo that parental guidance to me. I always say that's that's the greatest Kiss song Kiss didn't write because if you listen to that, that is such a Kiss song to me. You know, yeah. we don't need no. No, no, no. It, well, the interesting thing about Kiss, Kiss were, um, everyone's like, ah, oh, they jumped on the bandwagon with the hair metal. Dude, they were always looking at what was going on. I mean, even Kiss was, I mean, look at Wicked Lester. That's what was going on in 71, 72, right? 73, you get the glam's coming in a little bit bigger and all that. And so Kiss has always kind of looked. And, and the funny thing is, and, I, and you'll get a kick out of this, if you go and listen to some of Gene's demos from the 77, 78, the post- Van Halen, after he saw and knew Van Halen, 
Listen to like Burning Up With Fever. Dude, he's doing all this scat David Lee Roth vocal stuff Gene is that he would not have done if he wasn't listening to David Lee Roth. I, I strongly believe. Listen to some of those demos where he's doubling the voice. You're yeah, yeah, and doing all that kind of scat yelling and stuff in there. I'm like, Gene is doing David Lee Roth here, I think. You know, or he's, he's picking up on that. And here's, I want to say about Gene. Gene is... <laughs> For, the weird thing about Gene, for his his blowhard personality, his he loves to brag on everything about himself. But I'm convinced everything he brags about is all based on his feelings of insecurity and inferiority. Because the only thing he never brags about is he's a great singer, he's a great bass player, he's a great songwriter, he's a fantastic musician, and he ne- he actually didn't care. Like that stuff he should brag about, he doesn't. And I and I even think, and I'm Team Ace. I'm an Ace guy. I used to have the you know tennis racket you know i got uh, you know i'm still an ace guy right i was always ace guy but i'll tell you i'm convinced that gene's probably the most talented guy's ever been in kiss and i hate to say it <laughs> he's a pretty unlikable dude sometimes but the gene is man you watch the early he's rock solid he's a great player he's consistent he was creative when he cared he's always been a great singer he's you know that's the thing he quit caring in yeah, the 80s yeah. Yeah, well, I think and, he and quit. the songwriting. Really I think he went... quit Karen before the '80s. Listen to Hotter Than Hell, dude. Paul doesn't even have a riff on that album. Paul's still writing power chords, rock songs. Gene's got "Watching You," Aces. You know what I mean? Paul later he had "I Want You." He had "Making Love." Didn't he say when he wrote "God of Thunder," "Hey, I'm going to write a Gene song or something like that"? Didn't he? Was that the one he said? He ripped Gene. Hey, I'm going to write a Gene Simmons riff or something. And he wrote God of Thunder, the riff. Anyway, Gene was writing killer riffs and all that. And then he kind of, I think he got the women and he got all that. You know, it wasn't drugs and drink with him, but he got all the girls and it was all about, well, it's all about what it always was about. But now well, it's well, like, I think, I think Gene stopped. And if you think about it, go back to Dynasty. He only had two songs. Yeah. Uh, on he had 40 demos probably <laughs> yeah well he, he recorded listen, everything he thought of i think yeah, he if you because one of the charms and you being a, a musician too and as a drummer i love playing with bass players that have that feel he aped mccartney so many times oh, totally who especially aped, on who, the first who, aped, who aped brian wilson actually <laughs> but i love yeah. beatles are my all-time favorite but yeah, yeah. yeah. Brian Wilson, a lot of people don't realize. So, so, so Gene, you're absolutely right. What an incredible bass player he is. And he just had great. Just in a musician. Sense. And I, yeah. and I honestly believe um, Gene, probably if you listen to Ace's solos on the Eddie Kramer demo, you listen to Ace after kiss. I think Gene had a lot to do with Ace's phrasing and that and Ace had phrasing for days, but man, you, did you ever get a, Firehouse solo when he went solo. Did you ever get a got to choose? Did you ever get one of those super basic, melodic, catchy? I think Gene, more than anybody, probably had that ear for phrasing. And I bet you he, and I know he's talked a little about having done guided ace a little here and there. I guarantee Gene had suggestions for ace and helped make a lot of those classic solos. Probably the phrasing, what it was. I'm going to, well, that's great my, my theory. About- what Ace's phrasing is, are there, there, you picked really one of the greatest examples of Firehouse. It's a song within the song. That, Absolutely. That, that, All of the that, solos that, were. That, and we yeah. didn't know what it was when we were kids, but I'm like, you could sing Ace's solos. I could always yeah. remember. 100,000 Years, another great example. Oh, doodle, 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 doodle. I still, you know what? I, ne- I hardly know how to play any Kiss songs, believe it or not. I never want to learn songs I really love because it takes uh, the mystery out of it when you know how to play them. I don't know, at least as far as guitar and stuff goes. Um, there's a lot of songs that I like. I want to keep them mysterious in my mind. I kind of know what they're playing, but I mean, when I learn a song, it takes a lot of the mystique away from it. So, yeah. Hey, I want, I want to get back to uh, sure. focus on the Hotter Than Hell, because where did you get the acoustic guitars for Going Blind? Is that, where did... It's all, listen, it's all Kiss, okay? There's a, I think it might be the... Is Vegas it the Unplugged? Or- is it the is Vegas that- Unplugged? There's a version of Coming Home later that was on. That's from European TV. That's European okay. TV. No, no, no. Because, so going because blind, that- the with Gene and Paul sitting alone, there's a European yes, one. I yes, pulled that's Paul's European guitar. TV. That's I, one song. On, before some purist screams, that's what I think. Again, guys, this is like a show where you're talking in a bar. I don't have the Google that's machine right. checking every fucking right. reference. Right. I think that's from European TV, but that right. was initially. So I was right. That's where you got. But there the are two. Accused. But there are two. 
Okay. There's also an unplugged backstage. I, I, was it like a the Vegas Live? Was there an unplugged piece of that? So, I can't remember exactly what year. There's a coming home. It's with Eric Singer. They're but they're back. They're not on stage. They're backstage, but it's professionally recorded. So yes. you can hear the that, yeah, that's from that's that. I, I I know what you're talking about. I think that's from the Vegas bonus right CD. So it's and, double, and, and, but it's both. And, and real quick, those two songs in particular, I love what you did with the drums. If I remember, I think you kept the the hi hat going throughout, where Peter was breaking for the flams, and and I. No, I, I just no, I no, I didn't change. I didn't change. Now, the, coming home, uh, and I'll admit, as much as I loved Hotter Than Hell, until I saw the convention tour and saw him play Coming Home, I didn't realize what a great song. That's got to be the worst mixed song of all time on Hotter Than Hell. <laughs> there are literally no, like either no overheads. There's, I mean, you can hear some symbols, but it's like they forgot to turn on the hi hats, and it's literally maybe a that's. I'm hearing them now. Yeah, you're hearing that, them. That I, I really there's literally no buddy, symbols. My my buddy Joe said something about your mix to me because um, we both been just geeking out on it. He's like, I can actually turn it up in my truck and listen to it now, and it sounds full. Yeah, that's how great your mix is. That's why your I mix it. In, that's why I mix it in my truck. <laughs> that's what well, you there you go, know, man. Well, but that's what I use. Can, that's you my. Can, you're absolutely right. All that high end that is gone on the original. I'm like going, I'm like immersed in it. Again, that goes back to the acoustic guitars that those two, two songs specifically. Um, uh, the, I think the uh, Vegas, I think the Vegas might actually be coming home. I'm thinking of, I can't forget which one because I did use symphony and I used a little of unplugged. No, I used the Gene and Paul European for one of Paul's uh, going blind. And then on the full acoustic version, the bonus kind of track at the end of the album that I did with mostly acoustic, that's the same one. And I pulled um paul and tommy both from the symphony show uh to, to mix it so it's all kiss playing i mean you know i'm tempted to go on youtube sometimes because there's like you want to get this guitar isolation and it's just not there and there's like guys playing it on youtube it's like nobody would know you know i mean <laughs> I, I always say every hey, nobody knew it was bob kulik on on a live <laughs> I, always, oh, I always say oh, oh. Hey, I always say every Kiss album is, is a little haunted. If you look deep enough, you'll find at least a ghost, one ghost in there somewhere, right? So <laughs> that's just how they've always been. Yeah, I know the alive thing. Well, get out of here with that. That's like people that are like, oh, man, Anton, Anton should have been in the band in the beginning. It's like, well, I didn't even know Anton until like whatever, you know. So but anyway, uh, I don't want to get too sidetracked. But the hotter than hell thing, you, you talked about some of the arrangement changes. And I, I try to be very careful, other than the added chorus to Parasite, which I just think it needs. The songs are so short on that album anyway, that it just, you know, I thought it was cool to add the chorus. Well, in. Hotter Than Hell, you extended the end. I extended it because that one's mixed very weird. The solos are very buried and they kind of trail off into nothing. I thought, well, that, you know, like after the solo, the da da da, you know, on Kiss Alive, you got to hear that riff, right? A couple times. All, so all the why, way I thought was was odd with the end. You, that was an accident, but, you didn't, but I liked it. But you it. didn't follow the proper line. The, you know what I mean? The, I did it on purpose like that. Oh, no, no. But that's my yeah. point. Yeah. That's. Well, that's, on the album. I'm telling was, you, so many times listening to this thing, I was like high five in the air. I'm like, this is so <laughs> much fun to well, listen to. And the thing is, like, I know no matter what you do, there's going to be some people that are just going to be haters. About yeah, stuff, fuck right? them. You can't. That's what so, I say all the right, time. But, but I understand it, too. Like, I. I looked at it kind of like, uh, I mean, all the way. Dude, the song's faded out by the time you get to that little, and you just, that little extra mm -hmm. thing I added. I thought, that's kind of cool. You know, I almost thought about putting that in as a little bit of a, you got, got nothing to lose, like an open break. I'm like, nah, yeah. I don't want to get too crazy with it. Um, I'm not Sean Delaney. I don't have, you know, I'm just doing my own thing. But I looked at it kind of like double platinum a little bit. You know, Sean took a couple liberties. Um, I don't like a, what he did too much in Firehouse or, or Black Diamond, but I mean. Oh, I do. I do. I, well, that, that's because it's big, well, dude, I don't want to hear the chorus. Reason, it it, it yeah. made it fun. And it's Well, different. I don't want to hear it. I mean, the end of, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm doing like pretty much all the old stuff eventually here. Um there's going to be a version of Black Diamond that doesn't have the original ending on it, dude, because I think I've listened to that once in 40 years, 50 years, just that slow drive. I get it. It's kind of a cool idea. Somebody was probably smoking a joint and said, hey, dude, what if we just do this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's like you never probably listen to it one time. But but anyway, I, I get it. I get it. But I, I try. But if you notice, though, the changes I made, 
are all pretty much at the fades, all at the end. I didn't get crazy with anything. I didn't like chop songs up. I didn't do any of that. There's a lot of stuff. Originally, I was gonna, I was gonna do an, a reimagined, and I was gonna reorder the songs and make it more of a. I mean, hotter than hell can be a pop album. It can be a doom metal album. It can be a rock and roll album. If it opened with uh, "Coming Home," you would hear a whole different album from the get go. You would see that album totally different. I, I kind of thought the same thing. Yeah, I, I really. But, but I thought, you know what? People are going to shit Ken, on it. Ken, why? Why don't you? Why don't you make two, three, four different versions well, like notice, that, and let and and just let let the fans that's pick why the ones I uploaded, they like. That's why I uploaded the full album, and then I uploaded each song. Make a playlist and put them whatever order you want to put them in. That was my view. That's why I decided I'm going to put the songs in the original order because everyone. But I am working on, and this is going to not be a long time for the purist. Um, and it's not a big deal. Um, I actually have created stems. Uh, the drum now, people that don't know I'm recording. Stems are uh, a, a stem of the drums doesn't mean the kick drum on a track, the snare on a track, the bottom snare on a track, time one time. It means the whole drums are mixed in a stereo, but they're separate from the guitars. It's just the drums. Mm -hmm. Well, I've actually created um, a snare sample and kick just right from Hotter Than Hell. OK, as bad as it might sound, I've taken the snares better and worse in certain songs. I've taken a few snares. I'm doing another mix. It's going to be really pretty quick because the guitars, I'm keeping exactly the same. The vocals, exactly the same. The bass, I'm taking the extra distortion off of it, putting it back the original tone. Um, keeping I, uh, There's so much guitar cleanup because, you know, that album's very harsh sounding overall, very upper edgy. So the, I'm doing a, a, a mix that's going to be about 85% what I already posted. And then what won't be on is no live cymbals, no live hi-hats, no other snare sample mixed in, no other kick. It's going to be Peter's Hotter Than Hell drums mixed as clean as I could possibly get it. So for the people that kind of like what I did and just want the original, no fade changes, no changes to anything. I'll be doing a version like that. And, and that'll be yeah, for anybody that wants. That's not as much fun, Ken. That's no, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, but it's, well, because remember, life, that isn't, point, life isn't fun, that Mark. Point, I think at that <laughs> point, I would just go fucking listen to the original. That's well, what, you would think, that you is think the that. beauty behind your, what no, you did. But it can be better. It can be the same, but better. I mean, there's things you can do. Um, to just to make the drums a little less harsh, a little less, you know, bring the cymbals out a little bit more, smooth out them. You know, the guitars are, are recorded really weird. It's like they have weird distant hollow sounds, the way they place mics. Anyway, we can get really sidetracked. But I, but I am um, working on uh, the one thing I'm really excited about is I'm doing it, a version of The Elder, um, High Necromonium. <laughs> nah. um, I, I talked to him. Uh, I, I warned him uh, about some of the stuff he was talking about. I'm uh, not a big fan of what he did because he doesn't seem to get what rhythm is or so. I just got to randomly chop stuff up I, or whatever. I, I, I'm not saying this. this yeah. Isn't no, no, no. Me. That's me. <laughs> he, knows, he knows. He's probably one of the gave me the, the three thumb down. There's three thumbs down. I'm like, is that Andrew, Necromonium, and Mick? Who put those oh, three okay. thumbs Come down? Let's not I'm kidding. Look. I'm kidding, guys. Anyway, listen, I'm working on an elder, but what I'm doing, and I absolutely have, I'm obsessed with the elder. I always have been. So what I'm doing is I'm going to do a straight remix, and most of the elder is, is great. It's just the drums are a little flat mostly. That's the big thing, right? So I'm going to clean up the drums, and people are like, man, put Creatures drums on there. Well, you know, I tried that, and it's not what you think. It doesn't work. No, you can't. You, oh, it doesn't it work. It would not work on that. Doesn't, right? And I've tried not it. At it's, all. It's, bomb, it's too bombastic for most of it, even the oath. So I've got it cleaned up. And what I do is I'm going to take some Eric Carr's recordings. I'm going to get a, Eric Carr's drum sound, get a good clean, like I did on the Fridays thing. The Fridays thing that I that I did the version of, that's all Eric's drums. It's samples from his drums, either from you know Auckland or whatever, mixed in over the original audio. So I'm going to do the Elder, clean up the drums, and I'm going to do a straight version. Okay, the original crappy Japanese order. But then the other one I'm doing is I'm going to call it the expanded, and it is going to have every scrap. It's going to have Council of the Elders got two or three versions of Only You. It's going to have a grand final medley, which uses pieces of all different mixes of all different Elder songs. There's See, that's be... the kind of stuff I'd be that that's because that take, that's creative. That's well, of... that's what I'm doing it for. I mean, I'm a songwriter. I'm a, a producer at heart. You know, I don't really do this stuff anymore. So, you know, we my wife and I were building a house uh, five, six years ago. I learned the software and I designed our whole house from the ground up. And I'm not an architect, but you don't need to be. You just you know, get out of your own well, way, you know? Uma, but Ken, that's here, what I want... drew me to the hotter than hell thing was, you know, at first, because so many people put these things out and, and you get like halfway through the first song, like, God bless them. They're trying to be, I get yeah, it. Yeah. 
Yeah. But but it falls flat. This one, I'm like, oh, my God, this is cool. Oh, my God, this is really cool. And then by the time I got halfway through the fucking thing, I'm like, the arrangement. Every You could tell it was not just a labor of love. You were being creative with this thing. But also, to hotter than hell, because it, it just is so notoriously not a good sounding record right Be- because and, and i'm going to leave this into tommy because i know tommy wants to ask you a question um how do you separate i mean how clean is your separation how the software that you use man it, it ain't it ain't it ain't the nasa shit that peter jackson's got i'll tell you that um it depends on your source if i have an album a studio album I can get pretty good separation. Now, when I started doing stuff, like when I did the Kiss Meets the Phantom edit, uh, the stuff was really raw, man. I could, you could hear phasing in the high end a little bit, you know, that arc, like that MP3 sounding. It was still really kind of raw and crude. It's gotten a lot better even than like the couple years, but I can get a fairly clean. Now, you got to think about like, to me, I'm, I'm maybe mostly proud other than the movie. I'm mostly proud of the Dynasty concert, I think, because the Dynasty was something that I think, I just kept telling my wife, for, I'm like, I'm tweaking it and tweaking it. I said, honey, there ain't nothing good from Dynasty, man. I gotta say, that's, Kel, that's what that's what drew me to your stuff originally. Like, I, I saw the Largo and I, I mean, don't like you said. There's other people that do this too, and they do. I'll tell you, I think everybody does a really good job for what they yeah, do. Yeah, but Absolutely. but I'm one of those guys like you were talking about earlier. I'm like, well, I'm used to it being this way. Blah 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 right. blah. Okay, well, the 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 Dynasty one is the one that caught my attention. I'm like, okay, this this is more aimed at somebody like me you really because that a they weren't playing very well on that tour um i, I take over, exception to a lot of the popular opinions about the dynasty well, tour. It, that's and, not a popular opinion that's someone who listens to no that's a, of, that's a common opinion um you have to consider okay now we got you know there's, well, there's on, let, let, let okay, me go move forward with this yeah. so we don't get sidetracked yeah. so that's where i was like hey this guy this guy's got something to offer this is for me, and I'm only speaking strictly for me. So that's how come I gave this hotter than hell thing like a chance. Cause yeah. normally I would just wouldn't even care. And I was so blown away. And then Tommy and I were talking now hotter than hell is, is say this hand, it's just a shitty sounding record in general. And I think most people agree. Yes. It's got its charm, all that, but realistically, come on, it's right. not a, it's not, and it ain't what Kiss and it ain't what Kiss wanted it to sound like. So correct, don't think correct. they were happy either. Correct. But now on this hand, and this is where I'm gonna let Tommy go, there's another record that to me and to Tommy, we wanted it to sound different too. It's so clean though. It's the opposite. It's it's so clean. Tommy, what is the record you want him to to touch up? I would love to see you do something with Unmasked. Absolutely. The only thing that Unmasked needs, okay, what, what all the Kiss albums needed was Gene's live bass sound. Right off the bat, I'll tell you right now, anybody that listens to the old bootlegs, you think you're hearing Venom. I mean, it is full-on <laughs> distorted. I use it in my band. Voivod had it. A lot of these Venom had it. But, dude, Gene was doing it in the early 70s, just turning the preamp all the way up. And, dude, when you would put on the spoolers and you hear the, you know, the drum check and the check, check and then you hear, Bo, you know, Gene's oh, like, oh my God. And, and you're like, well, maybe that's why the live album doesn't sound like the studio. And that's a big part of it, man. I'll tell you right now, Gene, well, uh, until Mr. Blackwell, we never heard that on a record. I don't think anywhere. Now, if you strip the tracks down and hotter than hell and the 70 stuff, he does have, even in, in like Detroit Rock city, it's like a little bit, like a little tiny bit of fuzz. But, dude, it's not. It's so different. Um, Unmasked is a great sounding record. It's a little thin. needs a little fatter bass. Guitars can be, you know, put a little bit more overdrive. You don't want it to sound like a Metallica album, you know what I mean? But, uh, yeah, there's a lot to be done. It's super great. I actually started playing with that one, too. And what I like to do is um, um, that's when it's, you know, I'm starting to do the, the, the debut. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do the first three. It's the 50th anniversary. I kind of missed the first album, but I'm going to try to get that done. So it's 2024. We'll have the first two. I'm already doing an expanded alive. It's going to be 
a lot of it's the work I did for the Winterland show, which I sourced Peter's drums from Alive and some of the rhythm guitars, but I re-edited everything to sync up to the Winterland show. So I'm going to do I'm an Alive remix. It's not going to be drastic in any way. It's going to be cleaned up, a little bit better drum sound, all Peter's real drums, but much better. Uh, and I'm going to do an expanded. It's going to include, okay, we know how fake the stuff was. Like on you wanted the best, you got the best, right? But I've done, I've done... Uh, room service, but it's going to be Peter's alive drums. It's going to be real drums pieced together from, because we don't know who's playing on what. It's the guitars. I've done a vocal, which is a comp of Paul's fake, whatever, 1997 vocal that he did, and his album vocal. And it, I've done it. I put it together. Certain words where you can tell it's new Paul are gone. You blend them together, and you sound like you have a different live can, can, 75 vocal. Can seek, out, can seek out the Cleveland 75 King Biscuit Flower Hour. Because yeah. that's what oh, they do it on there. Do they do? Do, yes. they, do they? Oh, OK, perfect. I can, perfect. I've, I got, can send it I've got everything I can find. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to send it, I, I, I don't have that. Yeah. Perfect. Because perfect. That's, that's exactly that, what I want. Got the 75 because I'm because I'm, I'm pretty convinced that two timer, the drums are super sampled or fake. But I think Gene's vocal sounds old on two timer. Um, but anyway, I'm going to be doing ladies in waiting. Everything they played. And that first era is going to be on this version of Alive I'm doing. It's going to have room service. It's going to have Let Me Know. It's going to have two timers. It's going to have, um, it's even going to have Love Theme from Kiss, which is going to be sourced from the uh, old Acrobat version, but it's going to be as if they would have put that in a set sometime in 75. And everything's going to sound like it's played on Alive. Okay. It's all going to, that's the challenge of trying to create this to make it yeah. sound. But you know, the Dynasty thing, you ask about separation. Dude, Dynasty is, okay, we've got the Atlanta, we've got Knoxville. Somebody posted part of Savannah. Rumor has it, you may know that masked man, Mark. I'm not sure, but somebody has Savannah too. But really, there's like a couple soundboards and there's a really bad Largo video audio. That's all you got, man. So that was a freaking challenge. And these are mono. This is the big difference too. Well, when you that's listen why I said that, that that one was, that's what caught my attention because that one yeah. didn't when you listen, sound when really you listen good. When people, when you listen to the headphones, you know, a lot of people don't think about mixing and stuff. You, what, what most bands will do is like, especially on the live albums, like Ace is in this speaker, Paul's over here. That's how a lot of people have been doing it for us. That's how my band did it. In fact, on our albums, I used to put Ken Nardi, left guitar, Kevin, right guitar. Because, you know, the right speaker, left speaker, who's playing what? You know, but anyway, but when you're talking about those bootleg shows like Largo, it's a mono recording. You don't have separation in the guitars. Even if you pull the guitar out from the drums and bass, it's one mono track. So what I would do, Ace is dominant in that concert. His guitar generally is louder than Ace. So what I would do is I would take Paul's guitar from pieces where there's no solo stuff going on, there's no difference. And then what I would do, instead of doing, there's this like fake stu uh, stereoizer effect people put on mm -hmm. stuff. But it makes that weird tin can echo, like it's like a slapback, right? It's a really weird echoey sounding. What I do to avoid that is I will take, okay, let's say you got Calling Dr. Love. There's the da, 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 right? The riff that goes to the verse, then the bridge, then the chorus. What I'll do is I'll take that and I'll give that to Ace. And then I'll take the second, the second pass of the verse and chorus and I'll put it in the other speaker and sync it up. There's the little nuances that are going to be different between the two. And it's going to sound like you've got two different guitars playing without it being fake stereoized. So just an example of, of that. And so, all um, that yes. well, wait a minute, Ken, all that sounds really cool. And I don't, I don't want to take anything away from you with all that, because I'll be excited to hear anything that you release. But since I have you on the show and we're face to face, I'm going to ask you if you would please consider when you rework the unmasked, get rid of the keyboards entirely. I would love to hear that record without keyboards and more of a bottom end. Just, I'm curious yeah. to hear what it sounds like. Uh, less, you, less of a pop, there, yeah, less there, of a pop record and more of a rock record. Well, here's yeah. the thing. Here's the thing. Listen to, l look at what my mix of Hotter Than Hell does. It's exactly the same songs. It's exactly the same playing. It's exactly the same singing, but it's almost like a different record in a way, right? It is. Totally. Uh, Unmasked might not need the keyboards gone to sound like a heavier hard rock album. Uh, well, I think you should bury them in a little. She's so European, know. you're gonna you're gonna lose a lot of that. And you ought to see do 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 you know, you might lose stuff. But yeah, of course, I'll do a I'll do a mic uh, or a special Tommy mix just for you, dude. <laughs> I would love it. Just because I would love to hear it. Here, here's and what I'm I not think saying, and I'm not the musician, so I'm not saying I'm right. What I'm saying is is that record, I love the songs, but they're just too gal darn poppy. And I oh, would yeah. love to see some bottom end in the same manner in which I would say to you, I actually like Crazy Nights, but I don't like the production. I'd love to see a, 
a low end on that record with some more bite to it. Yeah. And when I do, you know, when I do the dynasty stuff, I'm probably going to do now. I don't like to, you know, here's the funny thing about kiss. Once we get beyond probably love gun era, you've got anybody and everybody playing on them studio records. Sometimes you got different yeah. drummer, you got different bass player. different. Now think about this. When kiss gets on stage and plays those, they're a cover band. They're doing a cover version of whoever that band is on the record. You know what I mean? It's literally why I was made for loving you never ever sounded as good as the album. It's just sounds supposed like to sound like the album. It never really sounds right. Uh, and that's true with a lot of stuff. You know, you've got songs where Gene didn't play it on the studio. The drummer's different in the studio. And then you've got, it's just like the four of us, if we were musicians and we went and learned the song and played it, it's almost that different. It's not the same band on the record that's live. That's why. And also I want to say real quick, Ezra and Peter, I believe and Mark, as a drummer, you listen to what Peter's contributions were. Yeah, he's a little sloppy. He's not, he's not world class in the early days, but man, he really played with heart. And he played to the song and he did a lot of cool ghosts, all that ghost stuff. Dude, you don't hear that with the other Eric's. And I'm just saying they're both great, of course. But when he got on Destroyer, Ezra so dumbed his drumming down. And dude, there's songs, there's stuff on like, do you love me? Peter would never have just done that. All the way through the whole freaking yeah, part. That's yeah, Ezrin. Yeah. And then look at look at Dynasty. So when people say, oh, the Dynasty tour, Peter's playing diminished. Dude, New York Groove, thud, thud. It's the whole song. You 2,000 men, straight beat, like maybe two drum fills, right? New, uh, New York Groove, uh, 2,000 men, what else we got? I was beautiful, love you. Four on the floor, straight through, no fills in the whole song. Uh, radioactive, straight 4-4. Four, four. Move on, straight 4-4. Four, four. Look at how much of that set is just uh, tossing and turning, just straight beat. But watch him play Black Diamond. Watch him play Detroit Rock City. Watch him play King of the Nighttime World. And he's still killing it. It's not perfect, but he's, he, Peter didn't really go downhill. The material, drumming-wise, went so dumb oh, down. I, 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 that's for a whole different conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah but so then will the, will the name of this next episode, this episode, be Kiss is Nothing More Than a Cover Band? <laughs> I didn't say they're not. They're, they are that's a cover Tommy's band. That's Tommy's title, everybody. Band. Tommy and named this episode. Big. Kiss covers their own albums live. You can say something like that. You want you you Tommy? Are you trying to piss off Kiss. other band members? Kiss uh, is the no. Kiss, biggest tr Kiss tribute band. Or, you know, anyway. Yeah, no, no. Right. Ken, I, Ken, I Ken, Ken let, let let me let me ask you here. So you you kind of talked about how you were going to create an extended version of Kiss Alive, sort of, right? And Alive too. Well, yeah. Could you actually create? a whole brand new non-existent live album. And where I'm going with this is back to your elder discussion. There was going to be an elder tour, which never happened. Yeah. Could you create what you would imagine kiss alive elder would sound like funny. You should say that I already have. I started working on this about a year ago. It's called the lost alive three. What it is, is it's an imaginary tour that never happened in 1981. It's built around the Elder, but it uses all of the Post Alive 2 Australia tour songs. So we get everything from New York Groove, I Was Married for Loving You. Right, Shit. right. Yeah, you, you'd, have to include, songs, you'd have to include those, some Unmasked, now this some is pure, Dynasty. This, this is pure fantasy, but after I did the Elder Fridays thing, okay, we have three real, true Elder songs live. Those are all truly live. I'm going to take those three. I have created a fan created instrumental, which it is uh, escape from the Island version that does the whole breakdown in the middle. And Paul does his rock and roll, rock and roll over that Bo Diddley beat in the oh, middle. So of I'd it. love to hear that. Okay. Oh, I, I, it's going to have that. It's got Mr. Blackwell replaces God of thunder on this imaginary tour. And it, Peter, uh, Eric, I'm sorry. You know, Mark, how he does all those do, 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 do mm -hmm. on his drum solo in Australia. Mr. Black, Blackwell is a little souped up, just a little bit faster, and it's got, you know, I never said, uh, and then in between the vocal with the little bass stuff, Pete, Eric is throwing in some of his little tasty drum fills, and then it transitions where the guitar solo comes to Mr. Blackwell. It transitions perfectly into his Australian drum solo, like in God of Thunder, and then it comes back out for the reframe, but it's Mr. Blackwell is Gene's 81 blood spitting drum solo song. And then the other thing I'm doing is I'm creating a purely fictional well you're all that i want is going to be sourced they did play that live that's there's no there's no soundboard of that unfortunately so that's going there's to be not. there's, there's not. going to be a lot of trickery under that it's going to have a little bit of uh, studio guitars mixed in but the drums will be recreated using P eric's drums from the other songs and then i'm doing a pure fantasy version of um oh and and, and an eye 
on the version of I. It's, it's sourced from Fridays. This is all going to be mixed, so it sounds like it's all from one concert. Um, so it's, the show's going to start with the little fanfare thing. You wanted the best, and then the oath comes in. That first, and Paul does his, yeah, his making love scream at the beginning of, of the oath. It's And then it's pretty much Fridays, and then it goes and it, within the so- concert. It goes back and forth with the newer material, and then it's going to end with I. And I has the, you know how like on Fridays they don't do the, and I, I believe, well, on this version, the crowd's singing along. So we get to hear a kiss go, I, and the whole crowd goes, I believe in me and I, ah. So this is what I would imagine them doing live. And it does a whole sing along at the end, like rock and roll night would do with the, and I, I believe. So, and then it ends with a little, the, uh, the, the talking with the audience and the door slamming after he's got the look of a champion. Boom, the crowd goes nuts. And then the encore of this Make Believe concert, because I didn't want to repeat any old songs, but it is going to have Detroit Rock City because Paul freaking nails the vocal in 1980 better than anything. I, it's his best. It, it, it does. It is. There's going to be an Eric Carr version with that vocal. There's going to be a Black Diamond with Eric singing it because it's different. There's going to be a Cold Gin with Ace singing it. And there's going to be probably Strutter because Eric gave it a whole new twist, I think, than the old version. So that's going to kind of be like the fake encore. It'll be these old tunes. So everything prior to that's going to be. And then the, the thing that's going to, be, the, going to be the tomorrow and tonight of the album is there's going to be a great live version of Charisma that they never played, but they would have played. And I'm going to be using some of Gene's solo tour stuff for that. Um, there's a great part, um, What Is My, where the crowd always sang along with the mm-hmm. Gene solo show. That's going to be on. So what I'm doing is a Lost Alive 3, pure fantasy. Now, I'm not going to imagine it's going to be a full elder story on stage, you know. No, King no, not Blue. not at all. It would, no, it would no be King, the... No King of the Front con- Ice, but it would yeah, have been it, what I think would be like about five elder songs that will be the, the beginning and the end and the sandwich of it. And then you're going to have all that unmasked uh, solo material um, and uh, dynasty material and everything up into that. And then some of the old tunes with Eric's twist with Ace singing Colgin, you know, anything that's a little different than what we already got. So that's sounds another exciting. big one I'm working on. So, yeah, so cool. yes, that's what I'm working on. And that's going to be called the, and I'm going to go ahead and wait till I finish with the elder and stuff. Cause a lot of the stuff I'm, I already, I've already created, you know, and Mark, I'll send you a little bit if you really want to hear what I'm, what it's just to hear what I've been Please. playing around. It's not, per, it's not perfectly mixed yet or anything, but just to kind of hear what I've been, been doing. I'm still playing around with it, but the yeah, the software's getting much better. I predict that before long, you'll be able to like pull up a song on your computer in an app, say get the drums, and then you'll be able to pull up another song and say put that those drums on that out on that song, the sound. In other words. Take this drum AI. kit and put this drum kit, put it on this album. Like, you know how people are like, man, you should do a love gun with creatures drums, you know, that kind of thing. Like, I think it'll be a, a press of a button. But and, before and that happens. And is, 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 is AI anything at a point that can start helping fill well, in what, little holes that's what it is. where you that's can't what, source material? That's what it is. It's, it's all, you know, AI is a, kind of a misnomer. Artificial intelligence, there's no such thing. Everything, you know, as a programmer for 20 something years here, I can tell you it takes like a thousand pages of code to open up a freaking window, basically. There's nothing that thinks except people, okay? I mean, in, 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 this, in this regard. Everything that a, that a machine does, you could do it faster, maybe. You know, a calculator can add up numbers quicker than a person would. Um, you could say, hey, give me all the, the this amount of red color, selected out of the photo there's things that can be done they would call that artificial intelligence right because you're not having to go pixel by pixel yourself so what it does is it listens and at this point when you like if you take a song take take any kiss song you got bass drums uh, guitars vocals basically right go back basic song what you could do is you say give me the drums and it'll take the drums out you're gonna get a stereo drum mix the better the source the better the result you give me just the vocal give me just the guitars you're gonna get a stereo mix now what i can do with kiss albums is if Paul's all the way over here and Ace is over there, then you do a two mono splits. I do left speaker split. Now I've got a Paul guitar track and I've got an Ace guitar track. Or you can do a separate, you can, there's a, something where you can take a stereo image and, and, you know, like the old vocal removers, all they would really do is dump those frequencies in the center where the vocals are usually at. And that's how you'd usually get those fake karaoke mixes you could do. So you could do the opposite. I, what I do is I pull down the side channels and boost. And for the solos, it's, you can kind of isolate the solo a little bit that way. Now, Hotter Than Hell sucks because some of the rhythms are right on top in the center, on top, like, uh, oh, quickly. Um, speaking well, of- you did that at the beginning of the Hotter Than Hell in your remix. You did mm-hmm. that. It stopped in the, da, 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 da. Oh, no, it was in Parasite. You yeah. did that. You, I changed some of the panning. 
I thought because they, because you yes, know why I did yes. that because on the album I'm pretty sure Ace probably, probably, probably played all the guitar on Parasite because it's a total different amp sound tone. I think Ace probably did both all the guitars on that song. And the thing is on a live Paul does the middle riff right. So I did that on the album. I believe I have Ace and then I think I have Paul do the middle I, like it's on the other side rather than on the album. I think it's all it's all the lead guitars all on the one side. But um, but I want to say. We all know that, as far as we know, the master tapes are gone for Hotter Than Hell. That I mean, for people that don't know, that's the ta the tape where the kick drum is by itself, snare drum is by itself, each guitar is by itself. That's the actual multi-track. And now, I I'm thinking it might have even been 16-track. And I think what might have happened was, if you listen to Double Platinum, now if you take Kiss Meets the Phantom and Rip and Destroy out of the picture altogether, I would say there would never were any multi-tracks, even in 78 at all for Sean to use. I don't believe Sean had any multi-tracks at all for Double Platinum. If you listen to those two songs, they're identical mixes. They sound different, they're a little bit EQ'd and tweaked, but man, everything's panned exactly the same. Or he had stems, meaning he had a stereo of the guitars, a stereo of the drums, because somehow they had Hotter Than Hell for the movie without vocals, right? They had Rip and Destroy. They had to at least have a, a, a musical, a, a vocalist mix of that song somehow. But if you listen, because I try to source the best I can get, okay? So when I'm doing a song like um, Let Me Go Rock and Roll, particularly is a little rough sounding drum wise. But, you know, and I, so I go to Double Platinum. I'm like, what has he got on here? It's a little cleaner maybe. I'll sync it up, make it work. And I was like, it's, it's the same. It's exactly every single hit, every tom is panned the same way. The guitar solo is buried the rhythms are up the middle on top of the solo. It's, it's, it's stuff I think Sean definitely would have changed. Even if he could have made it sound fantastic, I think he would have changed that stuff. So I don't think they had multi-tracks at all in 78. Maybe, maybe vocalist stems of the background mixes, I don't know. But I think Sean would have did a lot more with it. Uh, I will say about Double Platinum, uh, it's, it's my go-to Calling Dr. Love. It's my favorite Calling Dr. Love version. Um, he did a great one on that one. But, um, but yeah. yeah, but I, I, didn't, I didn't like taking the drum break out of it. Yeah, I, you know what, I can't even remember. Song. You know, the Kiss, Kiss comes like, you, you hear them a million times over the years, and it's like, I sometimes forget what's different about the different versions, because, I mean, forget like the the, the 45 version of Detroit Rock City, which Colin is a Dr. nightmare. Calling Dr. Love has a, the different ending, and the drum break in the middle's gone. Well, what I like is it, it takes out the... it crazy, because I love the intro. What I think I like is that it doesn't have the Dr. Love <laughs> in the chorus is the talking voice, <laughs> you know, and the intro is cool with that, you know, whatever. But uh, yeah, anyway, yeah. Awesome. yeah, 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 yeah. But, but anyway, so yeah, there's, <coughs> for me, it's not a matter of being creative. It's a matter of trying not to be too creative. And that's why when I do The Elder, for sure, I'm going to do a, just a cleaned up version. I think it's a fantastic record. I think Paul... Look, Gene, Gene shines on the elder like nothing. I've got a, I'll send this to you, uh, Mark, because I've already got this, if you want to check it out, just a rough version. Like, I have a version of Only You. Now, to me, I'm trying to make that, like like I did with the Kiss movie. Not Listen, I'm just a dude doing what I want to do, okay? I'm not saying I'm an authority. I'm not Scorsese. But the Kiss, when I re-edited Phantom, I, I really literally broke it into three acts. I tried to figure out, let's make the story. Can we make more sense of it? Can we put more Kiss music? But with um, with the Elder, I'm 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 trying to fill in some holes. Like, like we get one little mention. Like, it need to have a love story, right? It's basically King Arthur. It's it's the hero's journey. You gotta have more of a love story. So there's actually a version of Gene and Doro doing a duet on Only You. Now it's the mm -hmm. music is from Gene's demo version. So it's not like I'm taking just the song from the album. This is a different mix altogether. Different guitars arranged differently. And Doro's is in a relative key. It's like, I think it's a fifth above or something. And I couldn't pitch either one to match. It would sound weird either way. You can, you can get away with a little bit of pitch changes, but not that much. So, but, but they're singing in a relative harmony and it gives it a really creepy, cool sound. So I've made sort of this where it's like the elders talking to the girl and saying only you, cause she's singing only you. And she started singing to the guy. So that's kind of going to be I, part I, of my story. I, I tell you what, I, I tell you what, cause we, we have to start rapping. But save all. I can't that. rap. You gave away a lot because here's what I'd love to. Here's what I'd love to propose. When you're done with it, could, would you debut that here and then we yeah. could talk about it? Yeah, anything. Yeah. Problem is, I, you know, I I, I I sort of semi I sort of officially unofficially retired a year ago, um, and I literally work on this stuff every single day, all day into the night, as up to you know. I just it's a passion of mine because. I'm a oh, lifelong Kiss That's fan. That's so beautiful. I'm yeah. a lifelong Kiss fan. I can't please everybody with anything. I know how it is, um, but I but I think I understand 
what not every Kiss fan, but I, I absolutely love so much about this band. It's my whole childhood. It's so much of my life. But I also understand something unique about Kiss fans. And this is why I think they tend to be, I mean, if you go into any band, the hardcore fans don't touch anything, right? But with Kiss, I think that there's this built-in defensiveness because those of us who went through it and had to, def- you had to defend Kiss. You had to like, you were so not cool yep. if you liked anything from 79 on, right? You were so not cool. And I was still the guy trying to play, hey, listen to Creatures to my friends are like listening to Bathory or something. It's like, dude, but, <laughs> but I think there's a natural and also it's so much part. And I'm talking like more like old school fans. Like I didn't read comic books. I didn't need to. I had a comic book rock band. I mean, they were superheroes. They were a band. They were music. And it's so ingrained in my childhood, in my life that I, when people change stuff, I'm kind of like, hey, man. That's my band, you know. That's my life. You're messing with, so I get it. I totally get it. But, but, your, but your, your passion is in, your your passion is infectious. Well, I appreciate. Yes. It. I only wish but, I had more time in a day to do. I mean, I, I literally work on this stuff all the time. I I, I really enjoy. Doing we've been going for an hour and twenty minutes. It seems like five minutes because that's the way that this... I'm trying to. I'm trying to keep my mouth closed. <laughs> Normally, it would be three hours, no, and you wouldn't have to. No, ask no, no, no. <laughs> I, I, again, because we've got other, we've got a couple other se- segments we still have to do, and uh, uh, as you know, because you obviously watch the show, uh, it's getting close to dinner, and the wife is uh, upstairs, and uh, all. Do you guys, like, do you guys like my what? version of the movie though? The movie? Do you guys like the? Ver- I haven't the seen it yet. Oh my god! I dude. didn't look. I, that I, was my I, first the- huge project. Someone said, "Hey, you think you could do something with the movie and make it less cheesy?" I'm like, "Of course not." <laughs> And I'm like, or maybe I could try. So anyway, no, I, 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 the, the, I'm new to this. Halloween, first, dude. It's Halloween. The first, dude. Check it out. first stuff of yours I saw was um, the Paul Lynn. Yeah. And and I immediately was sending it to these guys and other yeah. friends. I'm just like, and it was just the absolute pure, crystal clear visual quality of it. Yeah. I was because there's, there's a clear you know version. you 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 you, you you you. There's a cleaner you, version that I got had to take down. Unfortunately, we we know that story, but that's yeah. A, I mean, that's the Amazon. You, that's the Amazon one I cleaned up. Actually, though, that I posted. I mean, that 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 was my kiss introduction. So when I saw yours, my eyes literally like Bugs but then, Bunny, but then like you, but then you were know, you mad, eyes were you mad. Were you mad though that it wasn't just? Oh, the, not the at all. I no, I think not Beth, at I think all. The Beth, the Beth turned out cool. That's pretty common back then to have a dude just sing over a track. You know, I thought that, you know, it's kind uh, of cool there was everything was cool about it. And to your original point, when we first started talking, I can always go back and watch the original. Right, if right, that's right. what I want to connect right. to. But it was just sitting here all these years later, looking at this going, my God, this looks like they're in my live in my living room. It was so beautiful in the quality <laughs> That yeah. that that was that was just what was jaw dropping for me. Yeah, for me, it's it's the audio, the the video, because again, you know, there's other people who do yeah. some of these things, and and I'm going to just tell you, I think everybody does a really good job. No one does yeah, a shitty job sure. doing that. But for me, having a great sound, and especially again that Dynasty show, because it was the original source was so bad. That's what made my the hair on me. Next, I'm like, wow, this guy's got some fucking skills. This is good. And then the hotter than hell, forget it, just blew me away. And that that's how come I reached out. I reached out to you originally, and I'm like, you got to have this guy on. I I I know well, there's going to be. I'm afraid. To, I'm afraid to do anything else now because I don't think anything's going to be as drastic as hotter than. I mean, I always I know that if I got it right, and lo- most fans would really love it because like me, we all hotter than hell is this is a great album. It always has been. Well, that's what I mean. The songs come are it's like hearing uh, hearing them again for the first time. Right. And and that's always been the rub with me is the songs are so fucking great. Some people but the ask production me, was so muddy. Some people ask me about the tempos. And absolutely I would love to have changed, but I decided not to do that. I decided not to no. speed anything up. Um you could of course, you know, uh uh Sean did it on double platinum with uh, was it Firehouse or Hotter Than Hell? Whichever the Firehouse, one. yeah. Firehouse. Yeah. But back then though, you couldn't do it without the pitch. You could do it digitally now. In fact, on the Largo 77 show, I actually slowed down Firehouse. It's still fast as shit, but I mean, they were playing. And that's another thing about Paul bitching about the tempos. Dude, you can't complain about Peter playing too fast. You're starting Firehouse double time. And Peter's just following you, Paul. You know what I mean? That's the case in a lot of stuff. And the same with Eric. 
Eric played way too fast and all the old stuff, but I, I, whether he was told to or not, I can tell you all drummers play fast live always. It's just, you have to try not to, you know, Mark, it's just, well, you, you get the adrenaline, adrenaline of the show. Totally you feed, yeah. You've heard that saying you feed right. off the crowd. If you've got a lively crowd. Yeah, you're right. Because your yeah. tempos are going to be up. But a, if you hear a if little you, bit, if you've been hearing any version of firehouse and then you watch uh, Mike Douglas, you're like, Oh my God, what is yeah. this? It's like, it's, yeah. It's almost like, did they just learn this like five minutes? And that's another thing. When you learn a song and then you start to play a song, it just generally gets a little, you know, faster. Anyway. Yeah. Anyways, we we got to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, trust me. Before Mark Kent goes, though, how do people find this on YouTube? Just go to Frankenstein? Yeah, that's that's a channel I made. I I mean, I had an Anna Cruz's channel forever. And then when some stuff was going up and things were getting blocked and there was a lot of controversy going on, I decided to make a different channel uh, in case. And, you know, and and that's another thing. I don't want to get all into that. But there's an understanding where, hey, there's stuff that what who owns it and who doesn't is relevant to me. I don't own any of it. If it's going to get blocked, I'm not going to waste my time. There's shows that are that are fair game, and there's plenty of kiss stuff that I can do without, you know, rubbing anybody the wrong way or getting into who who owns what or anything. Uh, I don't own any of it, so if it's up there and it's safe, it's good. I mean, don't you think I'd absolutely love a kiss alive using all three nights of Kobo? I mean, absolutely. I think it gets shot down quicker than any, you know. Well, not- you know, and 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 that's why you're gonna have less issues just doing your remixed versions of an album. That's because, why I'm focusing on the audio. You know, you know, yeah. the worst that'll probably happen is Universal's just going to say, you can't monetize the channel. No, We're going to monetize no, it. Don't. Yeah, they say and, that and, and that's it. They're not going to take it down. Right, And right. Sh- no fan. Dead guy. Yeah. Fan can <laughs> claim to own the audio right. recording yeah, of, absolutely. of, of and, Hotter and, Than Hell. But what sucks is um, everything on YouTube is blocked by the audio, in case you don't know. It doesn't block video. It doesn't know what video is, I don't think. It's the audio that always gets it blocked. Like, you could put up a silent version of Kiss Beats the Phantom with no audio. It's not going to put, put well, good fellows on it. For, for, the mo- for the most part, you're right. The, the, the audio fingerprinting technology right, right. checks immediately, but they do have video fingerprinting maybe technology so, so. that, that, yeah, that I, I, know for, I know for years people would be like, well, we used to be able to fool it because we would put a red tint over the video yeah. and then it wouldn't look the same. Okay, but they, my, they've gotten to the... They, my, Largo, my Largo 77 show, it gets blocked, okay? But I have every single clip from the show up separately and it's not blocked. When I load it privately on YouTube, it says copyright, you know, just copyright, which just means I can't monetize. It's not blocks, there's no effect. Right. When it goes live, it always blocks it, the whole show. It thinks it's Kiss Alive too. And it thinks it's Des Moines. It isn't. It's a completely different mix. Little bits and pieces of some of those shows, but it's a totally different thing. Same way for uh, Winterland. Uh, Winterland's 100% live vocals from the show. The music, some of it's replaced. Thinks it's Kiss Alive. There's certain things it's not that smart at doing, but it's usually the audio that's the issue. But yeah, that's why in, yep. in, in Necromonium, so these guys do fantastic cleanup work. I mean, Andrew, a lot of these guys do really great cleanup work. Um, I wanted to do something a little different, a little more creative, a little different edge. That's why I'm focusing on audio stuff. I wanted to get a great Alive era type show. I wanted to get a great 77 Love Gun era show. I wanted a great Dynasty show. I wanted to do Australia. That might be an issue. So I may just do the live audio thing of that. And I was going to do the Creatures Rio thing. Just to have, uh, for those fans who want to have a really clean, good sounding, good looking of those eras. That was my my goal. At this point, you know, I'm not like, hey, hired by the band to do remixes of the whole catalog. You know, I'm just a guy. I'm doing Dress to Kill, and I'll tell you, there's going to be a great version of Don't You Hesitate, and It's the Fire that are going to sound like they recorded them for that album. And Man of a Thousand Faces. All three of those songs are from that era. All three are great songs that could have easily been on Dress to Kill. So I'm trying to put a little bonus extra I love stuff that. on each of the mixes. Like, like when I do the, the debut, I'll have an ace vocal version of, of Cold Gin. You know, never happened, but hey, it's kind of cool. It won't replace the original, but I'll have that on there. Uh, I've done some, you know, I've done like the Paul version of God of Thunder for Destroyer thing. I've, that's when I first started doing stuff. It's like, what would it sound like if I took, I don't know if you ever saw that, my fantasy final kiss show. Of course, it didn't happen where everybody was included. I don't know if you saw that Black Diamond video. Check that out on my channel. There's a Black Diamond fantasy version that would have had everyone that was alive, plus Eric singing a verse of Black Diamond on the screen. At the time, it was right before Poughkeepsie, so there was no audio of of uh, Mark St. John. He was not included, but everyone else would have been on stage. Eric would have been on a video screen. It would have been my fantasy final 
check that out on my channel if you get a minute. But yeah, it's it's a big mega mix with all the guitar players playing. They each get a solo. Peter shares vocals. Paul does vocals. Eric Carr does a vocal like they do with like the Bohemian Rhapsody thing. You know how they'll do that with the video. Um, anyway. So yeah, so I'm I'm excited, um, and, and and I'm not saying I take requests, but people are always asking, and they're like, "Hey man, redo uh, smashes, thrashes, and hits," or and I'm like, "Well, they already redid that, and that's why it sucked." <laughs> and I don't, and I don't want my mixes, and I know people criticize. Listen, I don't want to give hotter than hell a 2024 drum sound. You know what I mean? Right. I don't want it to sound I'm like glad you did. Uh, Avenged Sevenfold playing hotter than hell. You know what I mean? I want it to sound a little bit more authentic than that. I want it to sound like maybe what would they would done if they had had a little more time and a little bit more to play around with stuff. Um, yeah, I'm doing samples. Yeah, I'm replacing stuff. But that's part of the challenge and the fun for me to do that, you know, to recreate the fantasy. And that's what Kiss is all about, the fantasy. You know, everything about them um, is, is part fantasy. And that's what's always great about them, you know? Uh, the I internet is great. Yeah. So anyway, I, I'm I know, happy you're doing it. I, well, so I please it. guys go out and support him. Go and check it out. Frankenstein on YouTube and see and listen to what he has to say. It's, and really I, it's yeah. I do it all for free because I'm a fan for the, you know, from a fan to the fans. It's for yeah. everybody else to appreciate. If you don't like it, just don't watch it. Don't you know? listen. Because I'm yeah, going to delete go. your comment if you're a dick. OK, you can you can <laughs> not like it. Listen, you can not like it. But if you get on there and say, Eric, Singer's a way better drummer than, no, I'm not going to say it. If you get on there and say Ace is the greatest. If, if you no. get on there and do that, I will show up and I'm going to censor your comment. Listen, if you start a fight, I'm going to delete your stupid comment. If you get on there and tell me how, who do I think I am, <laughs> any Kramers, you know, if you do that, I'm going to delete your comment because it's, yeah. it's just stupid, right? This is for you can fun. say That's you don't like it. for. You can say, listen, you know, you know, it's it's funny. It's like there's, it's like some fans feel like they're cheating on the band if they listen to a different mix. I'm like, you know, I thought I liked this hotter than hell at first, but I don't know. I think I like the original. It's like it's okay. You can listen to both. I mean, you're not cheating on them. You know what I mean? It's not like that. It's just another version of it, right? Some people are weird. That's all there is. And a million people can remaster it, and all you're gonna do is add different EQ and different compression. One hundred percent. I, I was going to say, I, that's why I was drawn to this. It yeah. wasn't a rematch. Different. That's the biggest scam of all. <clears throat> oh, you're right. You just adjust the EQ. Who gives a fuck? That's yeah. what made this so you can do much a little fun. more now. You could do a little more now. Separate mm -hmm. the drums, maybe give a little different EQ to the guitar than drums. But it's still going to be what it is. But it's, yeah, that's but what you did was night and day. It was a it was a remix. Go uh, listen. Go it, listen to coming. Go listen to coming home on the original, dude. There's yeah. literally no hi hat or cry or ride symbols. Yeah. It's just Exa exactly like what they I literally had it muted right out of the gate. They just muted it and didn't notice it until they mixed it and then walked away or something. It's weird. Very weird. All right, All right. I, I I I got. We gotta yeah, go. Yeah. We gotta go. Yeah. So no, I appreciate thanks, it, guys. Man, thank you so much, man. Thanks, All right, man. man. All right. Take care, guys. Appreciate it. Mark, I feel like you went fanboy there. <laughs> what a, you know what? Uh, full, full, full disclosure. I've never talked to uh, Ken before. He's an interesting um, guy. Oh my god! I, I his passion, my, as you said, you, his passion is infectious. He it is. is my he's my kind of guy. He's somebody that I know I could sit and talk music. That's a come to remind him. Like we've been talking now for like an hour and twenty yeah. minutes already. I mean, yeah. I, I know because I remember the very first time after we had our technical difficulties. Uh, the very first time I was ever on the show, um, you know, it, it seems like it flies by in five minutes. You know what I mean? It, especially when there's so much to talk about, but boy, I, his, his, his passion is infectious. His talent is, is, is incredible. Oh my God. The, the, you know, we, it's, yeah. I, we could, we could come back and maybe we want to do another show of just literally like walk us through one song of how you do it, do it. Like, how do you take, the, the the original song listen to it dissect it figure out what you need and then where do you go find all the source material and how do you bring it in and i i mean yeah it just seems like that whole process i'm just like overwhelmed by what he's going through and finding well, all the source materials to recreate this and i had one question i'm going to have to message him about but i'm going to ask you mark because you're the drummer so maybe you can answer this my biggest issue 
from just being a, a listener of the album. I, I've always loved Hotter Than Hell because I love the songs on it. And I remember even as a kid hearing them on the songs that they did play on the Alive album going, God, why can't all of Hotter Than Hell sound like this? So why is it that the drums sound the way they do? It, it, it's an it's a it's almost like it, a weird it, it, tone that I've never heard before. It it could be the room. It, it, it there's so many very Tommy. There's no one thing. Okay, uh, could be the mics they used. Um, again, it, it doesn't sound like there's very much ambience. There's no none. none that's what I mean. It, th those drums could have had tons of padding on them to cut the ring off to where they made them dead. I mean, there's there's so many things that I don't know because I wasn't there. But there's no one thing like, oh, that's because of A or that's because of B. Yeah. So many variables. Um, also, too, they were mixed terrible. I mean, I never liked the way that record sounded in general. I agree. That's, that's really the poster boy for a bad sounding record. record. Now, the reason we do love it is because the songs are so good. And also, too, it's got its charm because it's so poorly recorded. Well, I, I think, you know, to your point, Mark, we know the songs are so good and and we know with all hope it could sound fantastic. Right. You know, you know it's if funny you, because you, you, you can't, you, you know, if it's a crap album to begin with, it doesn't matter. You can remix it all you want. It's still going to be crap because the songs are crap. Right. That's well, not the case. Listen how clean the first record is. Look, go just listen, listen. Yeah. In your head, just go. Ding, ding. It's almost tinny to the so. Clean. Same with the same with Dress to Kill. It just doesn't yes. have any bottom yeah. end, but they're clean. Yeah. So that's why, as a kid, well, even still to this day, I'm like, well. But you answered the question. It, it's where you record. It's so many different things. But I just couldn't understand why the first record and the third record sounded good, but the one in the middle, well, like, what the hell? Here's here was my thing with it and especially kiss keep it, let's go back to 1974 the technology was there guys with eddie kramer as the engineer now that's a, a thing you know there's a little theme there eddie didn't engineer the first record or produce the first yep. record but go listen to zeppelin one especially da -da 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 I mean, it's got tons of power. My point is the technology was there for KISS, but it, it, they didn't, you know, they didn't take advantage of... They didn't spend you know, the money. They had, they had yeah, look at Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. That was 1973. Freaking amazing. That's what I mean. But, you know, they had Kerner and Warner, and, and that's who they used, and that's the kind of records Would, they were making. Wouldn't it? And, wouldn't it do you, what do you guys think? It could be interesting to take something like this hotter than hell and then get like one of the engineers we've had on in the past and get his take on what was done and how could you do it and what would you change? You know, get a professional engineer who may have actually worked with Kiss at some point. Well, I I'll also know too, you know, what what I what I said to Tommy earlier really is unless you saw the drum room. Unless you saw, you know, did they have any, you know, they use any padding on, on the skins? There's so many variables. You know, how did they use more than one overhead? That's, you know, the, to catch ambience. You know, that was one of the things, like, especially with Jimmy Page working with Zeppelin, he'd, he'd have fucking mics all over the rooms. I mean, he, he really caught that, that sound. Um, and that's what's kind of frustrating about really the first three records. Um, you know, look, for as much as I love them, and they're three of my favorite, not only Kiss records, three of my favorite records of all time. But you got to give it up. Those, those song, those albums don't sound like Zeppelin One does. They don't sound as good as they could have sounded. All three of them. Right. You know, I agree. Um, and that just is what it is, you know. Um, but again, getting back to our guest, I, I thought Ken was so genuine. I was yeah. I always say that he's the genuine article. That guy gives a shit. That guy's passionate. That's somebody you should really pay attention to. He he's really good at what he does. And like I said, you know, there's lots of people. I've got friends that do the the video thing, but that's never what that's not what caught me. What caught me was the audio. That's what right. I'm really into. I love good sounding stuff. 
And and what he did with his Hotter Than Hell remix it is really just, it, it's so it's so much fun to listen to. I must have listened to that thing 10 times now. And well, again, I can't believe that the people were ripping him over it. It's like, what? Oh, what? Fuck him. Oh, come on, yeah, Tom. Like, come on, Tommy. It, it's it's freaking Kiss nerd fans. They're gonna they're gonna crap over everything. Uh, it, yeah. You know, they'd get a blowjob and complain about it. I yeah, mean, that's literally. It, it, I, it. I felt I felt a tooth. You suck. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just got your first blowjob that you've ever had. So shut up and enjoy. It. Oh my god. So. I mean, yeah, I, you're, you're right, Mark. What I loved was his enthusiasm, his passion. He's doing this because he wants to do it. That's it. Not because he's trying to get a job, not because he's trying to sell it, not because he's trying to impress somebody. You know, he's just doing what he wants to do. And if you love it, that's great. He loves it, too. If you don't love it, then go back and listen to the original. Nobody's I, destroyed I, the original recording. I love this attitude. I'm going to keep making them, whether you guys want them or not, because I'm making them because I love them. I love that. That, yeah. that kind of goes back to us three. Yeah, We don't have to do this. We just do it because it's fun. And that's why you I know? like him. That's why I respect what he's doing, because he's doing it because he loves it. Yes, yes. You, you know? can't beat passion. Passion trumps everything when you're, you know, you're doing a projects like that or you keep doing something because you love to do it um you know which i'm going to touch on in the intro see because we're doing the end first so um <laughs> all right so home homework obvious homework question is have you listened to ken's remix redo re-record however you want to call yeah. it it's not it's it's not a remaster let's be clear have you listened to his hotter than hell? And what do you think? And then I would say second question, what would you like him? Because as he hinted to, he's always taking pick requests. One. Pick one. Don't pick half the cat. Yeah. Pick one. What is, you know, I threw out there. I want that fakes recreated. What would an elder concert sound like? Which right. thankfully he's doing that already on his own. Yeah, We didn't know that. We, we didn't, didn't know that. that. I no. didn't know any of this stuff. What was what is the one thing an album or recreating a live event? What is the one thing you would love him to go in there and and redo, fix up, make different, whatever you want to describe it as? Yeah, you already know what what my choice is. Yeah, you're. I mean, I was I was told Mark. I'm like, I got a couple questions to ask, and you asked him about Unmasked. I was like, well, that was one of my questions. Is like. What can you do with Unmasked? I'm with, I'm with Tommy. That's the one that I, I want to hear. I want to hear that with, especially Is That You? I want to hear that with a heavier guitar. I do like Ken's point where you may not necessarily have to remove the keyboards. You can leave them in there, but if you bring up other parts around yeah, it, yeah. Then, then, then the keyboards aren't front, center, in your face, oversaturating everything. And I'm all for that, too. Right. I just I, like... Make I, make unmasked less poppy, more rock. I don't care how you right. achieve that goal. Right, I agree with that. So there's your there's your two homework questions. You know, what do you think of Hotter Than Hell, and what is your one item you would like to make a request? All right, that's it. Three sides of the coin. We're done. We're out of here. I don't think I insulted anybody this week. Eh, who cares? Mark might have, <laughs> but who cares? What are you going to do? Um, that's it. We'll see everybody next week. You have something to say? Leave a voicemail or send us a text message. Call 320-515-4771. Sides of the Coin, provided by LarryDavisVoice.com and by JessicaMarsVoice.com. That's Mars with a Z.